I'm here to talk to you about my arts and mental health uh, project, Mental Spaghetti. I've written down what I'm going to say because I'm not a natural public speaker and I tend to sort of ramble off and get overexcited. So, so hi everyone, my name is Marie Louise Plum. I am a visual artist and curator and I founded the non-profit arts and mental health project Mental Spaghetti in 2011. A um, bit of housekeeping, I'm not an art therapist, which is a question I often get asked, are you an art therapist? Um, I'm an artist and curator, and I promote artistic practice, which is in itself therapeutic, um, but I am not by trade an art therapist. So uh, secondly, I describe Mental Spaghetti as a project rather than an organisation, as it allows me the fluidity I need to work with many different clients and a large variety of commissions. Um, and that is from running creative workshops to one-to-one -one mentorship, assisting in research and development, and then I get more sort of peculiar projects, which I rather like, um, such as creating a collaborative sculptural memorial garden with young people in Bedfordshire. And also I'm just about to start decorating the interior of a medium secure unit in Derbyshire uh, with the they call them patients or ladies, I call them artists, and with the staff there. Um, so when Georges asked me to speak today, I first assumed it would be to punters, so like the people that I usually work with, and that would be to further their artistic practice. Um, but when I found out actually it would be trade and my fellow peers, I had little think about what I could share that would be of most value. Um, for me, I think that would be talking a little bit on bridging the gap between us versus them in arts and mental health. Um, and when I say us versus them, I, I'm applying that to many different and not necessarily opposing tribes in the world of mental health and arts. Um, but firstly, I'd like to talk to you about how Mental Spaghetti came to life. So in its former incarnation, Mental Spaghetti was a blog about me personally and na me navigating the NHS mental health system. It was quite an angry, visceral and confessional blog, um, quite funny too, and it was all the juicy things that in time would get me a good readership and I spent a long time on that confessing and talking through um, my therapy sessions and divulging lots of information I probably shouldn't have. Um, however, it became quite apparent that my blog wasn't working out for the best. And after first upsetting all of my family and my friends, I then realized it wasn't that helpful for my sort of mental health at the time. So um, I didn't quite realize it before then that, you know, because writing this blog was so cathartic, but actually it left me immersed in sort of mental ill health with a strong sense of us versus them, us being the unwell, and them being clinicians or people who were trying to help who I didn't think really could understand. Um, so I decided to turn the blog into something else for the greater good and as I had a good head start with the readership I'd built up, I figured I can transition it stealthily without too many people noticing. So instead of focusing on myself, I started posting pictures and stories of artists with lived experience of mental ill health. Uh, famous dead artists, established and emerging living artists, and also the completely untrained and unknown. Um, then I started taking submissions from people who wrote to me, sharing their work and wanting to promote it, but not really knowing how to, not having skills to make their own website or just how to get stuff out there. So the work that I've got here, clicking through, is a variety of work from people who've made work in my workshops or these uh, paintings here are actually from patients, uh, all male patients in a medium secure unit in the north of England and they're currently on show at the Dragon Cafe in Southwark. Um, so, as I started to feel better, mental spaghetti grew. People started to get the know, to know the blog, checking back weekly to see which artists I was promoting and I was asked to give creative workshops, both by hospitals and mental health and arts organisations such as the Scottish Mental Health Arts and Film Festival. So today, Mental Spaghetti is a successful arts and mental health project working alone and in partnership and collaboration with other organizations, such as Bobby Baker's Daily Life in Stratford, if you might have come across them. And I work quite a lot with the Dragon Cafe in Southwark, 
um, and I also work in art institutions such as the Wellcome and the William Morris Gallery. <clears throat> So I've explained that I work with various artists, organizations, and clinicians to promote participation in the arts, and also artists who are themselves marginalized. And I think, I say think, because things are always fluid and always changing, that my main goal with Mental Spaghetti is to make the fluctuations in people's mental health a more normal thing, a thing that we're a little more used to without sort of labeling, diagnosing, and saying, you know, oh, they're so mental or... And I think especially since differences in people's mental health are often so temporary, um, an understanding that we all have mental health, whether it's good or bad, and that it can be up and down, and to further understand the diag a diagnosis and disorder without detracting from the differences we feel and how we identify that it's, it's good to make it a little more normal to, to feel differently and act differently. So... Although mental spaghetti had a flying start, if there's something I know, that, that is, things couldn't all be plain sailing for long. I'd had it quite easy from forming mental spaghetti to developing it, then getting to the meat of the issue. People can be very resistant to change, especially if they are feeling unsafe about the world and other people around them. And so this is something I'd really like to break down with what I'm doing through arts, um, but obviously it will take a long time and creating a discussion about mental health and taking ideas and formalizing them will also be quite a long road, but it's you know, good to keep going. So an example of someone who didn't quite get what I was doing. Um, when I had the good fortune of The Guardian writing an article about mental spaghetti, I was surprised to read some of the below the line comments. And my boyfriend at the time said, if someone writes about you in a paper, just don't, don't read the comments. There might be good ones, but there'll be some really bad ones, so don't. And so someone had written, I don't think that schizophrenic artists in the Prince Horn collection died under Hitler so that you can come along and reorganize what outsider artists have been struggling to do for over a hundred years. And so this got me kind of like, Jesus, I'm just trying to do a workshop and like get people talking to each other and making a piece of art. And, and then there's this, you know, ah. Uh. So I think what this, this man was cross about was the fact that I'd made a comment in the article about how fashionable the topic of mental health had become. And it was just that, it was a, tom topic, uh, a comment. I wasn't endorsing it. I wasn't saying whether it was good or bad. It just has become, you know, quite a talked about thing. Um, so I think he thought I'd jumped onto a sexy topic, which it has been described as to me before, by people trying to, having a pot of money, wanting to, funding, to fund something to make themselves also look good, and they'd sort of said, you know, it's a really sexy topic, mental health, come and do a workshop. Anyway, so I guess he thought I was using it to my own end to kind of promote myself, but that really wasn't the case. But anyway, you can't please all the people all the time. So another example of thinking people will be happy with what you're doing because you think you're doing something good, but they aren't happy about it is this. I recently started working with two groups in similar situations in that they are both resident in hospital. Um, both groups are resident in medium secure units. One's an all female unit, one's an all male. And um, so it's a medium secure, it's the same security as a category B prison with 99% of the patients in the unit having offended in some way. Um, the patients, as the staff call them, again, I call them artists, all have complex mental health needs or severe disability. So this one group is really fantastically enthusiastic about having their artwork promoted and by dint of that, sharing their private world inside the hospital to others who might not have experience of that. And the other group, um, when I went to visit them and suggest we open the doors of their unit to invite people in, because they had some amazing artwork, really amazing, but like shuttered away in folders and no one ever saw it. And I was really enthusiastic and said, hey, why, you know, you've got a great space here, let's have an exhibition, it'll be brilliant, we'll invite people in from outside. And then they, they kind of balked at the idea and one of the, one of the ladies said, um, you know, she thought I was like this dangerous do-gooder sort of coming in. And she just said, what, what do you think? Why would you do that? Why are you going to invite normal people in to come and laugh at the mental people? And I was trying to say, it's really, it's really not, it's not like that. But, you know, language and discussion is so important. And it's so important when you're collaborating with, for me, 
patients or service users or people who might be highly suspicious, it's really important to have an open discussion about what their expectations are. Um, for example, going in to decorate this hospital in Derbyshire, I, you know, I wouldn't come in and just be like, right, I'm the artist, I'm going to do this, I'm going to paint the walls, I'm going to put this up here and that up there because you'll like this and you'll like that. I have an idea, then we'll sit down, all of us, and discuss it because they live there and they need to decide what, you know, what they want to have and what they don't want to have. So um, now this is where I've scribbled all over the page and I've sort of forgotten where I'm going to. I think the most important thing I wanted to say is that to move things forward, it's essential to have open debate and discussion um, with the very people you're trying to involve or get to know in your research, um, research performance, whatever it is you're doing. And showing that you care about their experiences and what they have to say is just essential. So Deborah touched on it earlier when she, was, she talked about the pedagogy book that I haven't read. But, you know, to, to know something, you need to live it or be close to it or put yourself back from it a bit. Um, so a good example of a place that does this is the Dragon Cafe in Southwark, which I've already mentioned. I don't know if you know it, but um, I just wanted to give them a little boost while I have the microphone. They, um, every Monday, they're a pop-up space in St. George the Martyr Crypt, and they have a programme of events running all day, midday to late o'clock. They have an exhibition on there every week, so this work from the guys in the Category B hospitals on at the moment. And they just do the most amazing things. They have a vegetarian cafe there. They have activities like creative writing, drawing, football, gardening, all sorts. But also at the end of the day, they often have um, a debate and an open platform with the patrons of the cafe who all have, have I don't know, had some sort of mental health difficulty, some of them have struggled with homelessness, they're all vulnerable or have been vulnerable in one way or another. And they started an initiative called Re Recreate Psychiatry, where psychiatrists and clinicians um, and medical students would come in and discuss with the patrons of the cafe how to recreate psychiatric conditions you know, going forwards in hospitals uh, and other institutions. So that's worth checking out. But that's, I think that's it really, what I wanted to say. All right, thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Hello. So if I could invite you to just um, sit for a moment so we can take questions, that'd be great. The lighting is very odd, isn't it? It's hard. I can't really see everyone, but okay. Questions? So, um, let's start. Um, I had a question, so I'll, I'll start yes. my question, if that's okay. And then as soon as we have arms up, we'll, we'll move around in the microphone. Um, my question is to do with the, the relationship between sort of vision and getting something done on a very kind of practical way uh, and the, the pace of the collaboration and the conversations and the, and the kind of tensions and the desires of different people that you're collaborating with. So yeah. either an instance that comes to mind um, or your observations on how do you marry that vision that you need to have to have put the project together, have the structure, have the intention versus the encounter with those conversations and, and collaboration? Um, okay, well, I'm a bit of a bull in a china shop. So when I get an idea of something that I want to do, I tend to just go in and say, right, let's do this. There are no barriers to stopping doing this. Let's just get it done. Um, obviously, sometimes I get a bit gung-ho and need to have more conversations with people about how it makes them feel. Um, I think, because I've done it for quite a while now, I always manage to couch things in, if we need to have a conversation, we'll say, okay, we've got this hour to discuss things, or two hours, or whatever, what do you think, and it's open. Once it's beyond that, things either move forward, things rarely stop. Um, I don't know... I think I've been quite lucky in that no one's ever put a firm kind of stick in the spokes and gone, no, you absolutely can't do this because of X, Y, or Z. So um, I find it harder when I sort of take 
a step back and I leave it to maybe, um, for example, hospitals or people with a big trustee group to, to keep things rolling forwards because that's when things can kind of stop and, you know, just ground to a halt. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's really answered your question, but yeah. So um, we'll start taking questions. So we'll start down here. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to just find out, like, you spoke about the workshops that you do. Mm -hmm. and I just wanted to find out, like, what that involves, like, what you do in your objectives of the workshops. Okay, so with the workshops, um, because I'm multidisciplinary, I generally run them, unless it's something really specialist, I'll get someone else in to do it. Creative writing, I usually get a poet in called John Hegley, who I work with a lot. In the workshops, you don't have to have any art experience, but when you come, it's not just like a one-off workshop. It's usually over five weeks, <clears throat> and let's say it's printmaking. I've been doing a lot of printmaking this year, because it's so immediate, and people, even if they think they're really crap at art, or they, they, are, you know, they can produce something that's great. And so we'll work on a body of work across five weeks and really nurture that, so people at the end of it have something that they have uh, worked on, kept the stuff they don't like as well as the stuff they like and gone through all the emotions of making that work. In terms of like how do they happen, um, I, I turn up to somewhere, like in Barking or Stratford or um, Kentish Town I'm at a lot. And I'll bring materials, people just turn up and I'll say this is what we're doing, printmaking, we'll get on and do it. If they like it, they'll come back. If, if it's not for them, they won't. But usually people come back. And at the end of it, the purpose is to have created something you've really nurtured. And you can take that. It's almost a portfolio of work. You can then take it, carry it on at home. So I'll tell people where to get the materials and what to do. Or you could use it to maybe join a course, get um, some accredited... Um, qualification or, or even take it into a professional field. Lots of people I work with are selling their work now online. Um, and so I'm always trying to subvert that notion that you can't, you're not an artist because someone hasn't told you you are. So, or I can't do it because I don't have a website. You know, in the sessions I'll say, this is how you set up a website. This is how you price your work. You know, you can do it. If you don't have gallery space, just go and find a cafe and sell work. Or So it's about pushing things forward and trying to get around those rules and regulations of you can't do that, you can't do this. Um, you've said that maybe has become fashionable to talk about mental health. Is this like a perception of yours or is this like something that you've read or what? Um, I think it's, some, it's a perception of mine, just that it's so prevalent, you know, the mental health discussion. Um, but it's also from, as I said before, um, organizations wanting to get involved in mental health. I mean, I'm not judging them about this, but it's like people wanting to get involved because they have a pot of charity money or money to spend on something, and they think if we incorporate that into the workplace, it makes us look good because it looks like we care about the people who work for us. Um, we can tweet about it, write about it, and we can join in the debate as well. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think it can be a bit of a dangerous thing um, in that people can become a bit blasé about it sometimes and just think, oh, fuck, I'm not, not again, not like another mental health day or another mental health week. So it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. But I think, obviously, it's good that people are having discussions yeah, mainly because you said that like you're trying to bring the mental health to a normal level. Yeah. So probably like, don't you think that these kind of things like being fashionable is like kind of good? A good. Yeah, I think I think so. It's just always the context. Um, I I cringe a bit when I say to normalize mental health because I don't want to detract from anyone's individuality or feeling different or their experiences. But it would be quite nice if there wasn't, for example, quickly. Sorry if I'm going on. The, there's like, I've talked before about two phases of mental health. One is like the kind of polished one where, you know, it's good to talk and like, let's all have a bake sale and chat. And, and then there's another where you see someone maybe walking down the street and you think, oh, they're, they're kind of, what, what are they, why are they following? They look a bit weird or, not me personally, but 
there's that sort of unsanitized version of mental health where you might be a bit more wary about getting involved with someone if, if you think, okay, they look weird or, you know, it's quite a... Uh, in, in most poster campaigns and adverts, and you always see someone quite high, highly functioning individuals who have good jobs, and then all of a sudden things have gone wrong, and, and that's more um, digestible, I think. So we have to be careful that you're covering every, everything, and, you know, it's a huge topic. It's a huge world of pain. <laughs> yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll take one more question for now. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, really, really interesting uh, project. Thank and you. I was quite struck by uh, you talking about the importance of openness uh, in conversations and debate. I'm just wondering if you've had any experience of where that's been kind of difficult or if there's been someone in a group who's been quiet or less inclined to talk about things and, and maybe how you, what strategies you might have taken to draw that out. Um, when I'm in a group or doing a workshop or it's, it, this conversation is really interesting because it's about disclosure for some part of it. So there's people on my website who uh, at, in the beginning were really keen to have their name on mental spaghetti, you know, and now maybe they're less keen because they don't want to disclose anymore. They don't want to be kind of like out and proud about their mental health. They just want to get on and not really talk. So. That can be tricky, so I've had to remove, so people have asked, you know, can, I, can you take me off the website now? But then specifically, in, in workshops, we don't really, if, anyone can be how they want to be, so if they're very quiet, I have to be really adaptable to everyone in that workshop, so it might end up that I spend a bit more time just one-to-one -one with them while everyone else gets on, but no one really sits there and talks about, it's not like, well, let's have a chat about mental health right now. You know, everyone just does their artwork. And as they are afforded three hours to work on something, they will naturally start to discuss, like, home life or family. Or, and then that's when things start to come out. But there's no pressure to, to have that conversation. Also, my workshops are open to anyone because I, I uh, advertise them on Eventbrite, so I end up getting loads of tourists that have no reason, no idea. Like, I get... Very, very, very often, lots of Korean tourists for some reason who are looking for activities, and then there'll be other people who have, you know, diff different needs, and so it's quite. I'm just a, a fan of chucking everyone in, which isn't, yeah, it's not always for everyone, but yeah, mental spaghetti, quite, yeah. What a great a, a way to end uh, your contribution. So thank you so much. Thank you uh, for everyone. coming down. Um, and. Marie-Louise will stay uh, around for a while. So yeah, I'll be here, and if you want to find out about the website or how to get involved or any, anything, what I'm doing. I'm never very good at self-promotion <laughs> in that sense. I don't have a card, but use, I'll write it down. Use the opportunity.